Welcome everyone to the La Jolla Cosmetic Podcast. I'm your hostess, Monique Ramsey. Today we're going to talk about something that you might have heard of out there. It's called a wake liposuction. And it's one of the biggest trends in cosmetic surgery right now. So if you're thinking about getting it from a clinic who's promoting the benefits of staying awake during the procedure, I think it's smart to dig a little deeper. So at first glance, it might seem harmless because you're thinking, okay, it's, you know, surgery is risky, maybe and general anesthesia is more risky than being awake. But to help us understand whether this sort of low cost option that sounds so sexy and great, you know, what are the potential dangers? And so Dr. Luke Swiston is here. He's back here to talk about this topic of awake liposuction. So welcome back, Dr. Swiston. Oh, thank you for having me on. Thank you. Now you do a lot of body contouring. That's one of your specialties. Your, pe people come from far and wide to have you do the 360 lipo and really shape their whole their whole body and help you know, make their proportions beautiful or handsome or rugged, <laughs> depending on who's on the table. So tell us a little bit about what is a awake lipo and why is it sort of becoming a hot topic? Well, awake lipo is basically just that is that you're having the procedure of liposuction, but you're not under general anesthesia. You're actually in some sort of a twilight state usually. And depending on the extent of the liposuction, the twilight state can vary and can be adjusted to that. But that's the big distinction is that you know, it does not involve general anesthesia. Let's talk about what are the risks of an awake liposuction and what does that mean? Like if, if I were on the table right now having awake liposuction, am I awake awake or kind of asleep? Typically not. Now it, it can, again, it can vary based on the extent of our liposuction. So for instance, I've had some patients where we did a full body liposuction and then maybe like after six months after they healed, there was one tiny little area, maybe somewhere on their buttock or on their hip where it's like, hey, you know what? We got 99% of the result, but that one little tiny spot could make it 100%, could make it beautiful. That one little tiny spot is so small that we can just put enough local anesthesia, just like num numbing medication around that spot that the patient really does not need any other sedation. They tolerate that just fine. However, if we're doing a little bit more liposuction, let's say somebody comes in and says like, well, I'm happy with my contours except for my abdomen right here. I've always had this problem with my abdomen. I just have a little bit more fat than I like right in this abdominal area, basically extends from my chest all the way down to the pubic area. That's a much bigger surface area. And while we would still use numbing medication in order to numb that area up, that patient may be kind of anxious about feeling the liposuction cannula under the skin when we are doing the actual procedure because it's a little bit of a different, bigger area. So that patient may benefit from something more to calm them down. And that's where, you know, we have a range of options available. Sometimes it could be something as simple as a Xanax or Valium, just that they take up by mouth, just one pill to calm them down and make them comfortable with the concept of what's going on. Sometimes if the surgery is even more extensive and maybe takes a little bit more time, some patients, some people actually use nitrous oxide, basically like the equivalent of laughing gas that makes patients kind of like zone out a little bit. The benefit of that is that they can actually control how much nitrous oxide they use. They have a mask that they just put on their face and if they get too sleepy, the mask just comes off. And then when they feel like they need a little bit more, then they can put their own mask back on. So they are in control of their airway and their own sort of mental state and sort of mental comfort, so to speak, mm -hmm. while everything else is going on. And that would be for like a little bit more of a large, extensive, awake liposuction. So those are the ranges of liposuction. But notice like each one of those instances basically gives us some level of mental sedation, so to speak, to be comfortable with the procedure that's going on. And it also gives us some level of local anesthesia, as in like we put numbing medication in the area that we're going to work on in order for the patient to be comfortable and not feel any pain. But when we when we talk about limitations of, lipos, of awake liposuction, that's literally the, the, the same concept is that at some point, the liposuction procedure is going to be too big for us to be able to use the local medications available to us, we're just going to run out of room. You know, basically the, the procedure requires more than that and the patient's just not going to be comfortable. So the biggest danger to me of doing awake liposuction for somebody who's committing to awake liposuction and wants a very extensive result is that we're not going to be able to finish the surgery because they may get uncomfortable or we may run out of the amount of medication we can give the patient to keep them comfortable. That's actually 
kind of the biggest obstacle for me. Some patients do come in and ask for a lot of liposuction and they ask, can we do it awake? And if you ask for a lot of liposuction, obviously we use numbing medication in the tumescent and the fluid that we inject under the skin in order to do the liposuction. And there's a maximum dose mm. that's calculated based on their weight. And we can't go past that because we use lidocaine. Lidocaine is the numbing medication. But if you look at what lidocaine does, it's actually a medicine used in cardiothoracic surgery and in heart medicine to slow down the rate of the heart. So if we overdose a patient on lidocaine, the ultimate side effect is we it's a heart blocker. Your heartbeat slows down and eventually stops. So obviously... We have to be very careful how much lidocaine we use, and we can't overdose patients on that. So if the patient's still uncomfortable and we ran out of lidocaine, the patient can get no more, then we're basically done with the procedure, whether I, whether or not I finished or not. Yeah. And this goes back to the mid-90s. So we moved into the Zymed building, that space we're in, in 1996, and Within a couple years, there was a really bad situation that happened in at another doctor's office, who's no longer there, a few floors up, and she was not trained to do liposuction. She wasn't a surgeon, and she was doing an awake procedure, and she gave so much local <laughs> that the patient died, and it was horrible. It was so tragic and it didn't need to happen. And so it was one of those things like, you know, even back then, I mean, that's 30 years ago, people were still, you know, people, oh, I don't want general. They're scared of it for some reason. And maybe Dr. Swiston, you can help help our audience understand why, you know, kind of the difference between local and general and why general isn't necessarily riskier. It's actually safer. Correct. Correct. And this is actually a topic that I come across with pretty much anybody that gets surgery with me because I do elective plastic surgery, right? Obviously, I do body sculpting. I also do a lot of breast surgery, breast and body surgery. And the vast, vast majority of what I do goes under general anesthesia, is done under general anesthesia. And literally every patient that I come across, their biggest concern about the procedure isn't the procedure itself. Most patients' biggest concern is, oh, do I have to go under general anesthesia? Am I going to wake up? You know, statistically speaking, look, let's look at statistics. Statistically speaking, it is safer for you to get on an airplane than to drive somewhere, right? You know, so if you look at statistics on the highway, you know, highway accidents happen much more frequently than plane crashes. I've yet everybody's a plane. Of, a, a lot of people are getting are, are afraid of getting on a plane because they give up control to the pilot. They have no control over what's going on. And it just feels like it's a risk. It's a bigger mm -hmm. risk than driving yourself, even though statistics don't pan that out. The operating room is the next level of flying on a plane as far as statistics, especially for an elective case. Think about it this way. It's basically, I always call it like the safest place in the world because think about it this way. Let's say you were driving home. Let's say you got into a car accident and you needed some sort of an intervention, surgical intervention. They would bring you to a place like the operating room in order to save your life because that's where we have everything. We have all the medications necessary to keep your blood pressure up or bring it down, your heart rate up or bring it down. We have a board certified anesthesiologist to monitor your airway and we can call in reinforcements for pretty much anything. And that's in a trauma situation where things are unpredictable. So imagine going into that room, except you're not a trauma, you're a perfectly healthy patient. And we know that because we've checked you, we've examined you, maybe we ran some labs just to be sure. You know, obviously this is elective surgery, so we take no risks and we dot our I's and cross our T's and make sure that everything is in place before we take you to the operating room. So you're really in the best case scenario. And then you're going into the most controlled sort of environment in the world to have your procedure done. So in that sense, this is the safest place, except conceptually speaking, everybody mm -hmm. thinks about it and they're like, well, I'm completely giving up control and am I going to wake up? So it is a leap of faith. It is a trust factor. You know, you're giving out control to the anesthesiologist and to a surgeon, but statistically speaking, it's literally the safe place, <laughs> one of the safest places in the world. And let's talk about, you were talking about the anesthesiologist. So all of our anesthesiologists at La Jolla Cosmetic are board certified anesthesiologists. Mm -hmm. And so they're the most highly trained in that sphere. And let's talk about general. So what does that look like, I guess, for the patient? Obviously, they meet their anesthesiologist before the surgery. Before that even happens, the anesthesiologist review everybody's case just to make sure that from the anesthesia standpoint, this patient is a good candidate. So obviously, I do my job as a surgeon, but they do their job pre before the patient shows up as the anesthesiologist. 
And once everything gets cleared on paper, then they meet the, the, the patient. They talk to them. They talk about their preferences. They always ask, like, what, you know, did you have anesthesia before? What do you remember as the biggest problem? Oh, nausea? Well, we can treat that more aggressively this time. We can make you a lot more comfortable than last time and so on and so forth. So they're very astute to tailoring the approach. Some patients just kind of want to zone out sooner. So those are patients that may get a little bit of medication, sedative medication to help them be comfortable and calm in their mind before they walk to the operating room. There are some patients that insist on kind of remembering everything, the, 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 their, their concept of like, you know, just not having a memory of what's going on. They're very not, not comfortable with that. So that mm. can be accommodated as well to some extent. But ultimately, as the patient is walked back to the operating room, they lay down on the table, we make sure that they're comfortable. And yes, we start an IV and we start applying oxygen. There's some sedation medication that actually comes in that is injected prior to the immediately before anesthesia, just so the patient is, is fully comfortable and oxygenated. And after they're completely asleep and not feeling anything, not remembering anything, that's when the anesthesiologist would secure their airway. There's different ways to do that and then make sure that they're comfortable before we do anything else. And why is a secure airway important? That's basically the anesthesiologist's entire job is to make sure that the airway is secured so that they can oxygenate the patient throughout the case. If it's a simple short case where the patient isn't moved around at all, then some, we don't necessarily need to use a tube that goes all the way down to the throat. That's another question that a lot of patients ask. Mm. We use something called an LMA, is a laryngeal mask. It's basically a mask that goes kind of like right in the mouth but does not go into the throat, and that's enough to secure the airway. For the cases that uh, involve 360 liposuction, that involve a lot of repositioning the patient, maybe from side to side or from front to back, then we want to, uh, the airway to be a little bit more secure. So we do use a tube that goes a little bit deeper and gets secured down there that way. But that's obviously the anesthesiologist's way of making sure that the oxygen is flowing correctly and they get a lot of parameters from that as well. So I would think the reason, and you can correct me if I'm wrong, I would think the reason that it's cheaper when you go compare prices because we all shop that's a, you know it's okay to do your shopping do your homework mm -hmm. that the wake would maybe be cheaper because you're not having a board certified anesthesiologist you know it might just Correct. be a nurse anesthetist it might be the doctor him or herself doing Correct. the doing that. So is that kind of where the difference is in terms of people comparing prices? If you're yes, just saying, absolutely. you know, over here it was 15,000, over here it was 12. Why? Mm -hmm. You know? Yeah, absolutely. So if we take the anesthesia fees out of the factor, then yes, then that becomes a lot less expensive because the patient is paying for the surgeon and maybe for the facility, but not for anesthesia. So that is a significant savings. But again, it comes with a significant limitation. And for some surgeries, for some liposuction that is small enough in the surface area and stuff, that may be a perfectly appropriate choice for that patient. But in others that are big, then it may not be a perfectly appropriate choice. Or it may lead to disappointment because like, well, we tried, we thought we could get away with it, but the patient became uncomfortable way too fast and we just didn't finish the surgery. And now the patient has like half a result. Speaking of that, <laughs> some people, now I've been in the OR to watch surgery and to film surgery. And, you know, I think in, in concepts like, oh yeah, it's lipo, it's, it's no big deal. <laughs> but they might be clueless as to sort of, it's a little bit of an aggressive procedure to get that fat out and how uncomfortable can it really be? And let's maybe ask you, looking back at when you've done it under local, like mm. in, in a small area. Like what is what are the patients saying in terms of what they feel? Again, it, it all depends on the patient. It all depends on the area where liposuctioning. I mean, fat in and of itself is not very innervated. So that's sort of the easy part. And if you have a patient that has a lot of fat in a specific area and that's our target, then all we need to do really is numb them up at the skin where we make the small incision to get under the skin. And then we numb up that fat that we're going after. We wait like 20 minutes for the numbing medication to really kick in. And then we test the patient's comfort level. And if the patient tells you, yeah, they're com I'm comfortable, I'm not, I'm not really feeling anything, then we can proceed and start getting some fat out. It becomes more tricky if we're doing a large surface area because now that cannula has to reach to much more places. So there is more potential for nerves being irritated and stuff. And it also becomes a little bit more challenging when the patients are thinner. And that's actually a very common situation for me. I do a lot of what we call skinny 
BBLs or you know patients who have a great BMI already. They they you know their height and weight are very appropriate. You know, they may be a BMI of like 22, 23. It's just that their problem is that they have a little bit too much flank fat and not enough like maybe fat in the buttocks. And they just want to shift their proportions just a little bit. But thinner patients are a lot more challenging to keep comfortable because the nerves are so much closer together to that fat. You know, like basically, if you think about what we're doing, we're removing fat from in between the muscle layer and the skin layer. The muscles are to some extent innervated and the skin is certainly innervated. That's where all the sensory nerves are. So if the fat pad is big and I'm in the middle of it, just getting some fat out and debulking that fat pad, that's usually well tolerated. But if the fat pad is already small, then I have to sort of be very close to the skin in order to give that patient the great result that she wants. And now I'm irritating those nerves a lot more. Yeah, I don't think personally. <laughs> no, thank you. <laughs> That's why we I, limit it to very small areas. Yeah. And I mean, and if basically... anybody's been, okay, this may be not a good comparison, but here I'm going to go with it anyway. If anybody's been in the med spa and had all therapy, you know, things, things that are not invasive, but, you know, they're there to you know, things like that hurt a little bit <laughs> and your nerves almost get more fired up. At least in my experience, it got harder the longer we went it, because my nerves were like angry. <laughs> and so finally and they're taking breaks and, you know, and it was the, mm -hmm. the experience was mm -hmm. crazy because it took too long because mm -hmm. I was in so much pain and mm -hmm. then they're trying to give me more medicine and then I needed a ride home. <laughs> Yes. Like, this thing sort of snowballed and all because I thought, oh yeah, I'll be, I'll be fine. <laughs> so <laughs> now in, ter in terms of who out there in the community might be doing awake lipo, is it board certified plastic surgeons or is it people who are maybe not a board certified plastic surgeon? Well, going back to you know, the example we gave at the very beginning of this podcast, I don't know who that person was. This happened way before my time here. But was that person a board-certified plastic surgeon? She was not. Yeah. yeah. So that's the problem, sort of problem with uh, with lipo in general, is because think of what the procedure is. It's it, it on paper, technically, any doctor can do it legally speaking. Why do I say that? Because what liposuction involves is you're making a small incision in the skin, and then you're putting an instrument underneath the skin to do some sort of an intervention. And then you're closing that incision potentially, right? So that is something, that's the equivalent of lancing a boil in, in an emergency room. Or that's the equivalent of like going to a family doctor's office to like to, make, to do a small, tiny like mole removal or something like that. So a lot of doctors, a lot of MDs technically have the experience, the expertise and the license to perform a small, tiny invasive you know, locally invasive procedure, lancing a boil, for instance. Now, liposuction on paper, the definition of that is doesn't vary that much from lancing a boil, right? You're still making a very small incision. You're putting an instrument underneath the skin in order to do some sort of an intervention. And then you're going to take the instrument out and close the incision. So on paper, it's about the same as lancing a boil. In reality, it's absolutely not. I mean, the, the, the extent of your intervention is way bigger. You're under the skin from like the abdomen to the chest, from the back to the flanks, to, you know, so on and so forth. Much more extensive area, much bigger risk because that cannula under the skin can also go under the ribs and puncture the diaphragm. It can go into the abdomen, puncture the bowel, all these different things, right? So it's a completely different procedure, but legally on paper, <laughs> It's defined as almost the same thing. My rule in life was always like, don't do any surgery that you can't deal with the complications. And the complications of lensing a boil are not very big. The complication of doing liposuction can be devastating, can be huge. I mean, if you puncture the diaphragm and, you know, give somebody a punctured lung or if you uh, puncture the bowel, that patient needs additional surgery in a huge, you know, operation and people die from mistakes like this. Mm -hmm. So, you know, you, you really should have a surgeon doing surgery, not an internal medicine doctor or a family physician doing that. And then the other thing is a lot of those doctors actually advertise themselves as cosmetic surgeons. Notice the distinction here, not plastic surgeons or board certified plastic surgeons, but cosmetic surgeons. So you have plenty of doctors around this country who are, let's say, family practice or internal medicine or, or ob who then go to Las Vegas and they get a court crash course in liposuction, which lasts a weekend. And then they get a little diploma that says aesthetic surgeon or, you know, liposuction 
trained or something like that. And then they post that in their office, but they advertise that themselves as a cosmetic surgeon, even though they are not a surgeon, they are an internal medicine doctor with this little diploma that they got in Vegas over the weekend. So, you know, what's wrong with that? And, you know, their training was a weekend. My training was six years in order to basically do the same procedure. So I can deal with the complications of whatever happens to my patient and I know how to avoid those complications. And I, I you know, I have the experience because I've done surgery way more extensive than liposuction. So I know exactly what's going on in there and how to limit my my intervention to keep it safe. Right. And I think for the audience, I'll have Hannah, our producer, put in the show notes a link to check. How do you check if your doctor is board certified? Because if it says on their website, board certified cosmetic surgeon, that's not one of the 26 or that's not a thing. It's not one of the ones that are recognized by the American Board of Medical Specialties. And you yeah. can go on that website and you can look up your doctor and see what they're board certified in. And I, I remember meeting at a, at a cosmetic surgery meeting where there were some plastic surgeons. There was, you know, I met a doctor who, he was an ER doctor and, and that's fine. <laughs> but like, does that train him to do blepharoplasty, you know, to do eyelid lifts, to do some of these things that are, you know, just different. Yeah. They're different. That's a great example, actually. You know, ER doctors are definitely trying to lance, you know, abscesses. So they are fully allowed to make a small incision in the skin and lance, uh, abs, you know, lance pus and then maybe close it or maybe pack that. They are also licensed to do conscious sedation. I mean, there, you know, ER doctors do a lot of local procedures in the up and in the emergency room that require a little bit of sedation. So they're trained in those things and they're technically you know, not legally speaking, not stepping outside of their license. However, they are doing procedures that they were never trained in in their residency. So one other question I have is about recovery. Would the recovery be any different after a wake lipo or with a general anesthesia? Is there going to be a difference or would it be not very observable? The recovery has everything to do with the extent of the intervention. Okay. So typically under a wake liposuction, the intervention is going to be a lot smaller for all the reasons we talked about. So I think the recovery should be probably a lot easier. If somebody's going under general anesthesia and they're asking me to do 360 lipo and fat transfer, then, and then let's say they start off really thin, <laughs> then those are the patients that are going to have a lot more of an extensive recovery because we're, you know, we're recontouring their body from their neck down to past their thighs. So the area of intervention is a lot bigger. And maybe they had liposuction in certain areas and fat grafting in other areas. So all of those factors will play into their recovery. Um, they even have drains a lot of times after that. But the result is going to be stunningly different than any result that I can get under uh, awake. And what is your advice to somebody who's interested in body contouring and as they go out and, you know, speak with other doctors out there, other surgeons, hopefully plastic surgeons, you, what, what, do you want them to maybe be asking about if they're thinking about this awake lipo versus general? Well, first of all, make sure you know who's doing your surgery. And we talked about that. It's sort of ad nauseum, but, you know, ask about the credentials. Where did you train? What kind of, you know, like what is your actual board certification in? The price shopping is is always tricky because that's how they get your attention, you know. The, but uh, then what comes with that? I think I think the old adage of what you get you, what you pay for really applies. I mean, if, if 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 somebody's advertising like a BBL for half of the price that everybody else is advertising it for, then there's got to be something going on. And I think, okay, let's just give a, a, an example. You know, if you're looking online and you see a Kate Spade purse and the Kate Spade purse is on katespade.com and it's $300 and you go to... Nordstrom Rack or you go on Nordstrom or Macy's or Bloomingdale's and the purse is 249. It's the same thing. And your price shopping makes sense in that way. Why would you spend 50 extra dollars if you don't have to for the same thing? But surgery is very different. And so you're not comparing that same exact experience or that same exact safety situation the training of the surgeon, there's a lot more to it. So yeah, we all want to be price savvy and conscious and, and, you know, make the most of the money we're spending. But to your point, you know, if you're not, it's not the same thing. 
Correct. You're you're not getting the same thing. I, I could assure you, if if for any if we take every single one of those cases, there is there is a catch. Uh, it's not the same product, probably not the same result, and a little bit more risk. And ultimately, that's the most important part. Is I think the patient is taking on a risk onto themselves that is maybe unnecessary for a purely elective procedure because they're trying to cut corners or because they're trying to shave down the cost. Yeah. Anything else, Dr. Swiston? This has been super informative, but I want to make sure, did we kind of address all the all the points that you wanted to talk about? I mean, I'm just going to say a couple of things that may serve as sound bites or not, but I guess the, the biggest advantage of traditional lipo under general anesthesia over awake lipo is that the patient comfort is not the limiting factor of your end result. That, uh, you know, the surgeon can actually do as much as they feel they need to do in order to give you the best result possible if your comfort level is out of the equation, if you're fully asleep, if you're under general anesthesia. And the last thing I wanted to bring up earlier, and I forgot, but I want to have in the show notes, we did, I think, two different episodes on anesthesia with our board certified anesthesiologists, where Mm -hmm. they're talking from, you know, A to Z the whole time about anesthesia, about the drugs that are used, about the safety of it and help. That would, I think, really be a worthwhile listen to hear them talk about it from their point of view and give you some things to consider. Because if we all go to Dr. Google, <laughs> we may not be getting all the right information. You're going to get and 10 so- results on all the plane crashes and no <laughs> results on the millions of planes that landed safely that day. Right. Again, that's another example I like to use is that, you know, that's just, it's statistics. And, you know, and even though it's one of those concepts where you sort of mentally speaking, give up control and that's the scary part, it's actually safer than anything else you can do. Well, thank you, Dr. Swiston. This was really educational and exciting to get to talk to you again. I haven't seen you in the studio in a while, so it's, it's fun to have you back. And thanks for enlightening the audience on the differences between a wake lipo and a traditional lipo with general anesthesia. Thank you for making this happen. Thank you for your time. Okay. Have a great day. Take a screenshot of this podcast episode with your phone and show it at your consultation or appointment or mention the promo code podcast to receive $25 off any service or product of $50 or more at La Jolla Cosmetic. La Jolla Cosmetic is located just off the I-5 San Diego Freeway in the Zymed Building on the Scripps Memorial Hospital campus. To learn more, go to ljcsc.com or follow the team on Instagram at ljcsc. The La Jolla Cosmetic Podcast is a production of The Axis, T-H-E-A-X-I-S dot I-O.